and greetings to all uh, SPE Java and SPG. Uh, today we are very happy because we can have another SPE technical discussion group, which the theme is evaluation of thinly laminated hydrocarbon bearing sand. As you know, uh, during uh, COVID-19 pandemic, SPE Java and ISPG always deliver high quality of webinar series. So hopefully to all participants, we can get something in terms of the knowledge from petroleum industry related with the core technical skill. And tonight in Jakarta time, we would like to learn about evaluation of thin lamination. Uh, our guest speaker today is uh, Mr. Kokoki. Uh, thanks and appreciation for Pa Koko because you would like to share with us. And today, our discussion will be led by Padidit as our moderator. Thanks, Padidit. Padidit is uh, our senior petrophysicist from Petronas, uh, Jakarta. So again, just reminder to all participants, please enjoy this talk. Uh, there will be uh, evaluation form later on. Please fill up for our evaluation. Uh, please give us uh, feedback. Without any further ado, I would like to pass uh, this uh, session to Padidit uh, for our moderator today. Please, Padidit. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Julianta. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, uh, thank you for your time, yeah, to attend uh, this technical discussion group that held by SPE Java section and also ESPG, Indonesia Society uh, Petroleum Geologists. Uh, I'm Didit, and I will lead this discussion tonight, yeah. Uh, as we know, we will discuss about evaluation of thinly laminated hydrocarbon uh, bearing sand. Uh, as we know, thinly laminated reservoir is one of the possible cause of the low resistivity and also uh, low resistivity, low contrast uh, 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 reservoir. Yeah. So one of the challenge from um, this reservoir or this LRLC uh, reservoir is how to define the real SW that will be effect and will be used for the calculate hydrocar hydrocarbon in place. And the other challenge is uh, very important is how can we identify that this reservoir is included in our the real in our uh, pay zone and how to identify. And uh, tonight we have a special uh, speaker uh, right now. Yes, uh, Koko Ki. Uh, maybe good afternoon, uh, Koko Ki. I uh, hope you are doing well, yeah? Actually, it is morning here. Yeah. Oh, oh, morning, yeah. <laughs> morning. <laughs> in morning uh, in Canada. So, uh, Kokoki is a petrophysicist uh, with 37 years of experience before he retired. Uh, he is the principal petrophysicist uh, in Petronas, more than 20 years uh, of the Petronas in KL. And he also worked in Slumbercy before as a field engineer in 15 years, yeah. And he has also published uh, 37 uh, uh, technical papers. So please, Kokoki, uh, you can present your presentation. And also, we have a one hour for the presentation from Kokoki. After this, we can discuss. Uh, you can ask question in chat table, yeah, on the next uh, one hours. Okay, I think it, this is for me. So this is uh, time is yours, Kokoki. Please. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everybody. As I said, it's morning here, so evening to all of you. Salamat malam. And for, uh, I was just mentioning to Didi, uh, Pat Didi just now that you know the talk is supposed to be uh, 60 minutes, and the question answer is uh, 60 minutes. I was suggesting that why don't I do uh, one hour and 59 minutes and one uh, one minute for questions? Okay, can I share the screen now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Can everybody see it now? Yes, 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 yes. 
Okay. Uh, once again, uh, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity given to me to give a short presentation, hopefully short presentation on this uh, evaluation of thinly laminated hydrocarbon bearing sands. Uh, as mentioned, it is a knowledge sharing talk. It's not one way talk. And I also do not, of course, usually when you start a uh, uh, talk on any technical subject, there should be uh, acknowledgements and a disclaimer. So here it is. Okay. Uh, this presentation is made for knowledge sharing only, and I do not claim that I am the expert on evaluation of thin beds, or I do not also claim that I know everything about thinly laminated sands. Uh, my, my principal experience on thin beds has been mainly as a reviewer of several projects on thin bed evaluation. And I wish to uh, express my gratitude to Adrian Bell, previously of uh, Baker. I'm not sure whether he's still there or not. Tom Neville, previously of Halle, uh, Slumberger. Uh, Roland Shemali, of previously of Halliburton, and Mr. Leong, uh, previously of Petronas, for the materials used in this presentation. Okay. Uh, okay, I think this is something is on the screen. Okay, the the contents which I'm going to follow, not probably strictly, but uh, uh, generally, is going to be a, a basic geology of thin beds, which I have taken the materials from uh, Mr. Adri Bal, an evaluation of laminated reservoirs from Roland Shemali and thin bed formation evaluation from Mr. Tom Neville, and the case two, two case studies, both of them from Mr. Leong. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 three, the, the first three topics are actually have been uh, uh, presented at the FESM Formation Evaluation Society of Malaysia on thin bed evaluations a couple of years ago. So I've already gotten uh, the permission from the relevant authors to use their material to present. And I don't claim that they are mine, so I'm keeping the presentation slides as they are from them, and also uh, with the reference saying that it's taken from them. Okay. So before we go into uh, more detail on thin bed evaluation, let's just give me, show you a, a screen dump of a, of a well. If you look at this one, you have uh, from left to right, you have a gamma ray, you have a caliper, which is showing that the hole is relatively engaged, and you have the resistivity in the resistivity tracks, and then you have got the porosity logs here. So if you look at the logs as they are, you see that there is a sand here. I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not, but there is a sand here. And then this section is a shady section here. And you look at the resistivity, in the sandy section, the resistivity is high. So definitely we know that it's going to be possible hydrocarbon. And looking at the neutron and the density, when it comes to the sand section, they're coming close to one another, uh, indicating that this is liquid and high resistivity is, of course, probably is going to be uh, hydrocarbon. But when we look at this shaley section here, we see that these are there are streaks of resistivity here. And at the same time, they are corresponding to a little bit of lowering of gamma ray here. So it's indicating that there is a, some sort of uh, sandy sections in here. But if you look at the, the uh, neutron and the density, it looks like a typical shale section here. But when this well was uh, uh, tested, and also with the, uh, uh, the jewel packer uh, formation tester, they have recovered oil from here. Then after doing some co-analysis, you see that there are uh, very highly porous uh, laminars here. So this is in fact actually is a thin bed, thinly bedded reservoir section which would have been missed totally if they had not done any uh, test in the, uh, over this interval or taken a sample with the jewel packer uh, MDD or jewel packer formation tester. So if you look at the, uh, the traditional uh, evaluation which is an Elan evaluation from Snobberger, you see that this is very nicely tracking the core porosity, and you have a lot of hydrocarbon in here, which is oil. Then in here, you do see some hydrocarbon, but not as much as you would have expected. So definitely, there needs to be something done over this interval to really evaluate the potential of the hydrocarbon in the zone. And over here, we have uh, the core porosity, which, which is quite, even some of the uh, stringers are even more uh, permeable than the sand in here. So let's leave it as it is. I'm going to come back to this example later on when, during the presentation. So let's start with the brief geology of thin beds. These are extracts from the presentation done by Adrian Bal in the from FESM uh, seminar on thin bed evaluation way back uh, in a couple of years ago in Malaysia. So thin bed geology and image logs, we're going back to nature. So if you look at here, here is a picture of, of uh, Dinge formation, which is the Jurassic age uh, in Southern France. And you can see that there are 
sh shield belts with thin string sen uh, sense fingers in here. So these are normally represented by resistivity resistors in parallel, which means you have sand resistor and shield section sand resistor. So we'll come to that again when you talk about how to evaluate these uh, laminars. Now let's look at uh, uh, four wells. So if you look at these four wells here, petrophysicists have interpreted a sand body here, a couple of sand bodies here, sand bodies here, and sand body in here. So that is our interpretation. Normally we'll be looking at the well logs, we'll be looking at the well bore, and we'll be identifying where the sands are and where the bays are. So if you give this set of logs or set of uh, 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 well columns to the geologist, that would probably be his interpretation. Okay, so he would have a, a two, two sands are connected to a, a sheet sand here, these two sands are connected to a sheet sand here, and you have a couple of uh, sand bodies here. And the same set of logs and same set of information, a geophysicist will probably look at it like this. Okay, of course, next slide I'm going to show you is, is a bit of a joke, not to offend anybody, but here it is. How a petrophysicist will be looking at the other people's work. So now, when we are looking at uh, a set of logs or looking at the reservoirs, how do we identify that we have thin beds? We have vertical fixes associations, or do we have uh, cuttings and mud logs which are suggesting that we have hydrocarbon based sands, or we may have cores or sidewall samples. Or if we look at the open hole logs, there may be some abnormal behavior which may indicate that we may have sand stringers inside the shale bodies. For example, spiky open, open hole logs, which repeat. Bear in mind that those spikes have to repeat. If they don't repeat, if they are random, it's probably noise. Huh? Then we look at the gamma ray and the SP, they'll be indicating like a silty shaley formation. And the looking at the porosity logs, they may be noisy. Uh, so a density and, and a neutron, they are trying to uh, mirror image one another, which means they're approaching to, together one another in a clean sand and separating in the shales. And the resistivity will be normally higher than the shale, normal shales. And if you look at the uh, higher resolution resistivity, like a micro SFL or a micro log, you will be seeing more spiky logs than, uh, than a low, low re resolution log, like induction or a lateral log. So that may be indication that we are having uh, sand stringers inside the shale body. If we have image logs, of course, we can see those uh, laminars on the image logs. Then next step further, to really evaluate whether those are hydrocarbon bearing or not, we'll be doing a formation tester with either a straddle packer or, or, a, or a jewel packer type of formation tester because we need to straddle across the sand, sand stringers. If you go and do a formation test with a probe, we probably will not be able to uh, hit in the stringer because the, the stringers are so small, the probe will probably miss it. So normally we have to use uh, either a straddle packer type of formation tester or a jewel packer type of formation tester. Or NMR logs may help. Then with the later generation of resistivity tools, which are known as multi-component resistivity tools or multi-component or triaxial induction resistivity type of tools, they will be able to give us RH, which is the resistivity in the horizontal uh, direction, and RV, which is the resistivity in the vertical direction. And from that, we may be able to extract the resistivity of the sand, which is R sand, and the resistivity of the shale, which is R shale. And using the R sand, we may be able to uh, evaluate a better looking saturation. Okay. So what are thin beds? It depends on whom you are asking. So another uh, uh, picture of a uh, Mount Messenger formation in uh, New Zealand, you can see that there are thin bedded, thinly bedded sand layers in here. So what is thin? For a geophysicist, a thin bed will be something like 30 or 40 feet thick, which is within the seismic resolution. If you ask a field geologist, the sand may be about a few feet thick. If you are a sedimentologist or if you are describing a shale, uh, 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 a core, it may be a few inches. For a, for a petrophysicist, it will depend on what is the resolution of the tool. Different tools have different resolutions. So if you're looking at induction log, it may be about five feet of uh, resolution. You may not see the thin beds, but if you are looking at micro resistivity, you will be able to see those thinner beds. And if you're looking at image log, you even, uh, even be able to detect uh, sand laminars. So it depends on your problem and your data set. So again, what are thin beds? Definition of thin beds according to Campbell. So if you look at petrophysical thin bed 
definition will be between 30 centimeters and above. So it can be very thick bed or thick bed. Then when we define thin bed, it will be something between 30 centimeters to three centimeters. For petrophysics, very thin bed will be between three centimeters to three millimeters. So if you look at the locks, conventional wireline locks here, induction, SP, gamma ray, they may be able to detect these beds which are relatively thick and uh, not so thin. But if we have thin beds, we may be able to go down and detect up to centimeter uh, levels. Then if you have a coal black, we can be, we can detect thin, uh, uh, thin laminar, which are down to about or, or three, three centimeters or one centimeter. Then thin section will give us uh, about, up to about three millimeter or, or depending on, or depending on the, the, the section itself, okay? Then this is an example of uh, uh, beds in a borehole image logs. So if you look at the, the, the image log here, it's about uh, one, two, three, four meters thick. Okay, then if you're looking at four meters thick, you will see that you have uh, alteration between sand bodies and the shales and the shales and the some sand stringers. So this is telling us it's, it's a finding upward sequence. But if you zoom down to one meter, even in a so-called uh, sandy reservoir section, you will still these, start to see these uh, shale stringers in here and vice versa, uh, uh, you will be able to see uh, 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 inside the shales. So here we have an image of uh, image log processed two ways, static processing and dynamic processing. In the dynamic processing, we are looking at a very smaller window and we are changing the, the window all the time. So we are able to enhance the image and we can even see thin stringers which are not apparent on the st static image. So now if you look at another example where we have a, a, a image log across about 17 meters of the well, well ball, so of course we see sands, we have some uh, uh, shaley sand here, shale interval. But if you zoom down to two and a half meters, you start to see that even in this shaley section here, you have sand stringers. Then you do zoom down further, furthermore, up to about 25 centimeters. Even in this section here, you see that there are sand laminars and shale laminars in here. Furthermore, you zoom down to two and a half millimeter scale, about an inch scale, even this little shale here, start to see sand laminars inside here. So it depends on the resolution and it depends on how fine you are going to look at it. So where do we see thin beds? So environments that have thin beds are lacustrine environment, fluvial aeolian, fluvial, glacial, deltaic environment, near shore, shelf clustic carbonates, deep marine. Okay, let me give you a warning here. I'm not a geologist. So if you ask me more questions on this geology, I probably have to give up. Okay, so then again, this is uh, again the, where the environments are and the uh, sub environments where we, are, we can find these uh, thinly laminated sand. Mainly nowadays, because we are drilling uh, uh, deep water wells, so mainly we will encounter these thin beds in the turbidites. So here is another picture again delta channel cutting across the uh, sorry, somebody is blocking here. So it's, uh, it's another okay, delta channel cutting across these uh, thin beds. Another example, I'll skip through this. So summary of thin beds geology is below, normally is below the vertical resolution of the most logging tools. It's found in most clastics and of course in some carbonates also. Internal structure can be quite variable and complex, but sand on sand contacts often overcome these complexities in the flow sense, which means as far as hydrocarbon flow potential is concerned. Internal structure may be confusing and lead to misinterpretation when measuring net sand from image logs. Because it, when you are trying to uh, uh, get the net sand from image, image log, it depends on uh, how you process it also. So we have to take it with a pinch of salt. Can we, uh, it can have good, ex, good to uh, excellent lateral continuity. And it is of, of major interest for EMP companies now because we are drilling uh, deep water wells and turbidite formation are the ones you normally we encounter in deep environments. And they can have world-class flow rates and recoveries. So, let me end the geology on this at this juncture and let's go to another. Okay, so here is uh, the uh, another picture of the, of the laminate, uh, laminated uh, sands and here is a pictorial representation of the resistivity. Normally, when we are measuring the resistivity of a formation and in early days we were drilling vertical wells and the tool is 
uh, vertical in the hole, and the resistivity measurement is always done in the in the horizontal section. So whatever we are measuring in the horizontal section is all because of the influence of the of the surrounding beds on the thin beds that we are measuring. It can be represented by resistivity like this. Resistivity is in parallel, so which means one of the over the resistivity of uh, horizontal in the horizontal direction is equal to one over R sin times the one minus V shape, which is a sand, compo sand uh, fraction, plus one over R sand times a V shape section. So that is a normal representation for the horizontal resistivity that we measure with normal tools in a vertical well. Next uh, uh, section I'm going to cover is the evaluation of laminated reservoirs. It's an extract from presentation made by Mr. Roland Shamali, who was a past SPW president and at that time was working for Halle Burton. And he was kind enough to come to KL and give us a presentation on this uh, thin bed evaluation. So his, his uh, uh, talk covers all these topics here, image guided deconvolution, electrical anisotropy, anisotropy measurement method using wireline, anisotropy measurement method using LWD, uh, from electrical anisotropy to saturation, which means we have a log which can detect anisotropy, we get RV, RH, and then from there we get arsen and shale, and then we can use the arsen to compute our water saturation. Then magnetic resonance log, NMR log for fluid identification and fluid samplings, because um, and NMR logs, they usually have better resolution than normal uh, standard logging too, so they might be able to detect hydrocarbon, uh, whereas the uh, standard resolution tool might miss it. So here is the comparison of uh, same, uh, same well, evaluated using high resolution method and a standard resolution method. So if you look at the standard resolution method, you will see that here we have the interpreted uh, lithology here, then here is the, uh, the saturation, and then sand, and here's the porosity. So if you look at uh, uh, this standard resolution log, you, you see that because of the resolu poor resolution of the standard uh, logging tools, we have about three feet of net pay only. Because some of those uh, sections are beyond the resolution of the tools. For example, this little sand here, the standard lo resolution logs are not able to resolve it. So we have missed counting the pay here. So we only have three, feet of net pay, which is probably under evaluating the reservoir. That if we have an image log, and if we use the image log for enhance, enhance, enhancement of the resistivity log and the porosity log, and we can come up with a, a bigger number of net pay. So in this example here, yeah, because of the enhanced uh, in, uh, done using the image log, we now have nine feet of net pay, which is six feet uh, uh, in, in increment over the standard evaluations, which is, which is about uh, almost 200% increase. So this is taken from the SP paper. And of course, this whole interval was being, this whole interval has been perforated. So uh, the whole interval has been produced. If it had been the standard uh, uh, evaluation, we would have only perforated across this uh, net B interval only. We would have missed the, the productive production from all these uh, interval here. Here you have an, a comparison of two image logs, one with uh, uh, electrical image log using LWD, logging while drilling, and the right side is electrical image using wireline logs. This is a Halliburton tool, so it is a six arm uh, device. So you have got six sections of uh, uh, logs here with some missing section in here. Is this, these sections are missing because being an electrical wireline log, which is conveyed on the logging, uh, logging cable, we cannot rotate the tool. But we do have the advantage that there are many electrodes, so we get a better resolution of the we better uh, resolution of the the logs, better image quality. But since the tool cannot rotate in the formation in the in the well, we have some missing sections here. Okay, the LWD logs because the the, the uh, drilling the, is on on the drilling assembly and it's been uh, rotated while drilling, so we have a 360 degree coverage of the well bore. But we don't have that many buttons. Uh, electrodes like a wire line, so we do not have the good resolution like a wireline lock, but we do have a full coverage of the well bore. And we can see that they do compare quite well. Where we see shale stringer, we see shales, where we see resistivity uh, sands, we have uh, resistivity uh, sands on the image in the wire line image lock also. The same log again. Sorry. <clears throat> so what is the use of uh, uh, the uh, 
the new generation of two, which can measure RV and RH. So normally, when we are drilling a vertical well, and if the, the formations are more or less horizontal with no dip or zero dip, whatever we are measuring is in the horizontal direction is RH, and RV is the resistivity in the uh, uh, vertical direction. But when we start to have uh, uh, formations which are dipping, what is going to happen is that the, uh, the horizontal resistivity is parallel to the parallel to the uh, the bedding plane, and the RV is the perpendicular to the the bedding planes. So, what is going to happen is that the RH in the horizontal direction will measure the uh, sand resistivity, whereas the RV will be a combination of the resistivity from the overlying and underlying uh, beds. If you go back here. The RV, by definition, is the vertical resistivity, and RH is the horizontal resistivity. And the ratio of RV over RH is the anisotropy ratio or anisotropy index. So, <clears throat> in a vertical well, where, where we are logging with a, a conventional uh, wireline tool with one transmitter and two receivers, and then let's say we have thinly laminated sands, and the horizontal resistivity we are measuring is two ohms. And the vertical resistivity we can measure is 10 ohms, whereas the actual sand resistivity is 20 ohms, and the R shear or shear resistivity is one ohm only. So if you look at and lambda, lambda together, it looks like the RH, which is the apparent resistivity measured by the tool, is two ohms, and RV is 10 ohms. So if we use the, the two ohm resistivity to compute our water saturation, we are going to say that this whole sand body is wet. We probably totally missed the base sense. And this is the experiment done by uh, the by Arco in their field in uh, in uh, in Alaska, where they where they have done the uh, logging in the vertical well, logging in the deviated well, and we find that as the dip angle increases, you, the, the the resistivity start to uh, deviate from from one another, depend and we start to see that the anisotropy uh, index increases from 1.5 to 3. Here is the dip angle, and here is the uh, horizontal resistivity divided by the measured induction resistivity. So the actual induction resistivity uh, is, uh, is here, and the RH is which has been uh, which is the true resistivity of the horizontal bed. So when we are a vertical well with no dip and formations are also flat, the uh, the ratio is about one. And as we start to increase the dip angle, we start to see the uh, decrease in the measurement of the RH, and then uh, we see that uh, the and isotropy also in increases. So that's why the industry has developed these multi-component uh, induction resistivity or triaxial induction resistivity tools to be able to resolve this RVRH issue. And here is a picture of the uh, of the uh, MCI from Halliburton, which is a multi-component induction resistivity tool. And this is also the uh, uh, ARCT, which is the Array uh, Compensated uh, uh, RT2. I'm not going to go, go uh, into this any deeper than that. So, of course, in the test world, they have done extensive uh, comparison between the uh, the uh, the array induction tool and the multi-component induction tool. In the multi-component induction tool, what they have is that they have got uh, uh, resistivity uh, coils uh, or uh, magnetic coils in three direction. Two, two in a horizontal direction, X and Y direction, and in the Z direction. So measurement is made in three directions, RV in the X direction, Y direction, and Z direction. And using those three measurements, they can re, uh, do uh, uh, deconvolute or the, they can do mathematical uh, resolution to, to get RV and RH. And fr from RV and RH, then you can compute back the R sen and R shale. So here is, an, uh, again, uh, all the test measurements that they have done. I'm not going to go uh, deep into that. So once we get the, the uh, multi-component induction uh, results or uh, measurements, we can invert them to get back the the, the, uh, the RV and RH, and then from RV and RH, by solving for the well angle and the, uh, and the shear volume and the sand volume, we can get back the R sand. So here is an example of the uh, LWD uh, as a mother deep resistivity tool with uh, the uh, tilted receivers and tilted uh, 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 transmitters. So here 
It's a cartoon. Why, we, why do we need to have tilted uh, receivers and tilted uh, transmitters? If we have a normal vertical well and we only have a 1D wave resistivity, which is a standard resistivity uh, type of uh, LWD tool, in a vertical well, we will not be able to resolve the, uh, or determine the anisotropy. Even in a in relatively angled uh, well, which is about 40 degrees or less, we will still be not be able to get good uh, anisotropy measurement. But when, you, of course, when we start to have a very, very high angle well, then we start to see the uh, anisotropy effect. Then we go next step, we get a tilted receiver. When we use the tilted receiver, it's still for vertical well, it's not that great. But when we start to be able to resolve the anisotropy in, even in the relatively uh, uh, deviated wells, and of course, even for the very highly deviated well, it's suitable. Then to go next step further, we also use a tilted receiver plus the tilted uh, uh, transmitter. Then it can be used to uh, identify anisotropy in or vertical well, relatively uh, deviated well, and very deep, uh, very uh, well, very, very highly deviated wells. <clears throat> Here, uh, we have a, a vertical well, and then we, here we have a, 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 a high angle well using uh, the EW, EWR log. Okay, so in a vertical well, we don't have much of an issue. We are measuring uh, the high resistivity, we are measuring this is the resistivity which we measured, and then we are able to uh, uh, compute some hydrocarbon in here. But when we start to have a, uh, the uh, uh, deviated well, we see that in the zones of interest, RH varies between four and six ohm. So what we are going to happen is that if we start using the, the four ohm, which has been measured as a true resistive formation, we are going to lose hydrocarbon base sense. Okay, so uh, from these uh, triaxial resistivity measurement tool, we can get RV, RH, and R shale, and then we can solve the equation. These are the equations here. We can solve the equations to compute R set and V shale. And then when we, once we get the R sand and V shale, we can use appropriate uh, saturation equation like Westman Smith or, or if we use the R sand and the porosity of the sand, then we can use uh, even Archie's equation to compute a better water saturation. So here is a comparison of the computer results uh, in, uh, uh, in TVD, assuming that R shale is 2.2 ohms and the shale anisotropy ratio is 2.5. And then comparing the result from the ADR, which is the azimuthal, uh, the, the, let's go back here, so that I don't make a mistake on the, on the name of azimuthal deep resistivity tool, okay? Compared with the core data. So <clears throat> here we have a uh, V shale, which is in red, and gamma ray is, uh, is in uh, green color here. I apologize for the quality of the slides because uh, I had to, cut and paste from the PDF, so it's not that, uh, the, the, it may not be very clear, like the original PD, uh, PowerPoint for slides. So here in RV and RH, obtained from the ADR tool, and there's density and neutron, and then here's the sand porosity section, and R sand, so evaluation of the reservoir based on the ADR tool is this. So when we compare with the core data, and the comparison of hydrocarbon volume from ADR with the core data, which has been smooth, the, the, the solid line here. So it's, it's, it's quite okay. But if we start looking at the core point itself, we are matching not too, not too bad. This probably would have been missed if we are using, if we are using a standard logging tool. Then we can still also use uh, NMR for uh, fluid uh, characterization by doing a plot like this uh, T2 intrinsic versus uh, dispersion or diffusion plot. So here we have a, a dead wire line, we have a water line, and we have a gas line here. So when we plot the, uh, the T2 versus the, uh, the diffusion, and if we are falling on here, it will be oil. If you are falling on this line, it will be water. And if you are falling on here, it's gas. So as I mentioned earlier, the NMR tool has a, has a better resolution than the, the standard logging tools. So even if the uh, standard logging tool missed the hydrocarbon because uh, of the thinly laminated sands, the NMR will be able to help us in identifying the fluid type. The, the next uh, logging tool which is available to evaluate uh, this thinly laminated sand is by actually taking the formation fluid samples. So if you look at this generation of uh, formation tester tools which are coming from Halliburton, 
The, previously, we used to use probes, a single probe, which is only about half an inch in diameter. So if the sand laminas are thinner than half an inch, we will not be able to go and penetrate the sand with this uh, probe and get to take a sample. And we might be, not be able, able to uh, position the tool uh, right on spot on the sand body itself. Then we can use, in that case, we can use a uh, sort of an oval pad or, or some people call it uh, elongated pad, whereby it exposes the, the pad uh, surface to about 10 inches. So we are covering the whole interval of 10 inches of the formation. We will be able to take a sample across the 10 inch interval. Even better than that, we can use a straddle packer or a jewel packer uh, formation tester, where we set a packer across about one meter interval and we are testing across a one meter interval. So we are covering this, the, the sand body about a three meter across the laminated interval. So we are able to take samples and from that. And we can even, even do a, a sort of a, a mini DST or of course some people call it interval formation tester or interval transient tester so where we can simulate uh, a well test if you like so here we have an actual coal for a carbonate well with carbonate heterogeneity and it is traveling across quite a thick uh, quite a big interval so because in, in carbon it's even it's even more difficult to get a probe across uh, a fracture for example or across a, a sphinger of, 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 of porous carbonate so with a uh, over elongated or, or over over packer, we should be able to cover a big interval compared to the normal probe. <clears throat> so let's go to another uh, short presentation from Mr. Tom Neville, previous to Schlumberger, and same thing. He was this he was this was presented at the FESM seminar on thin pair evaluation in Kuala Lumpur. So again, what are thin beds? So we have, we have covered it before already. So thickness between two feet and one inch, depending on uh, which type of lock we are using. If it is a conventional lock, resolution is about two feet. If it is an uh, image lock, it will be about an inch or co plug. Very thin bed, less than one inch. You can uh, get it from image uh, lock resolution, co plug diameter, and uh, measurements represent an average response of beds below their vertical resolution. So whatever we are measuring with, with our logging tool, it will be uh, an average across, across those uh, in, uh, intervals. So there are two fundamental approaches on evaluating a thin bed. One is bulk analysis. Bulk analysis meaning we are using the conventional uh, the standard logs. Then we compute the average reservoir porosity within the height of the investigation of the different, different uh, uh, measurements. Another one is a high resolution analysis, whereby we enhance the, 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 the logging, logging log responses and compute the reservoir properties in each thin bed. So in the bulk analysis, we assume that we have got two system, binary system, a sand and a shale. So the resistivity of the sand layer are defined, defined by Archie's equation. One over RH, one over horizontal resistivity is equal to fraction of sand divided by fraction of the resistivity of the sand plus the fraction of the shale divided by the resistivity of the shale. So in terms of porosity and in terms of, of, of uh, shale fraction, this is how the equation looks like. This is, uh, this is actually the saturation equation that uh, we have been using for shaley sands. Again, this is a, a distribution of shale in a, in a reservoir rock or in a formation. If it is a clean sand, let's say we have a shale volume, a shale volume of 30, 0 percent and porosity is 30 percent. When it is filled with dispersed shale, we have a shale volume of 30 percent and porosity of 3 percent coming from the, because of the shale, shale porosity. If it is laminated shales, uh, it's going to occupy some portion of the, the, of the matrix plus porosity. So we're going to have a shale volume of 30% and the reduction in the porosity is about, it's about 20, 24% now. And if it is structural shales, it's going to uh, take up the uh, bunch, uh, the, uh, the huge amount of the, uh, the matrix. So we're going to have a shale volume of 30% cutting into the, the, the matrix. And we have uh, some increase in porosity because of the shale contribution of the shale porosity is about 33%. So, when we plot the, the uh, neutron and density logs on a standard uh, neutron density cross plot, here we have the, on the x axis we have the neutron porosity and the y axis with the uh, bulk density. Our standard uh, plot a ternary diagram would be look, would looking something like that. 
Here we have a water with 100% uh, neutron porosity and one gram per cc for the density. Then we have a clean sand point, which is 0% porosity and 2.65 matrix density. And then we have a dry shield. And inside here, we can have uh, uh, some sort of a, a fence which we can which we can have the endpoints giving us a, a structural shield point, wet shield point, and dispersed shield point, and the clean sand. So if we by plotting our density and neutron points in this uh, 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 area, we can identify what what portion is uh, contributed by the uh, structural shale, what portion is contributed by dispersed shale, and so forth. So here is another uh, diagram which is probably known as the uh, uh, Thomas Tiber plot, where we have a shale volume versus porosity, and then we have structural shales are here, the 100% shale is here, dispersed shale point is here, and the clean sand point is here. So by plotting our logging uh, density neutron points, depending on where they are plotting, we can determine whether they are actually dispersed clays or are they structural shales. And from there, if they are structural shale or if they are laminated shales, what is a portion of the lamination shale laminates and what is the portion of the sand? So we get V lam from, from these plots and we can get, get the V sand from this one and we can compute sand porosity and sand, res sand resistivity. So experiment done by uh, Shlomberger using their NMR log to uh, differentiate uh, the, the percentage of sand and shale from uh, NMR log. So here is the experiment they have done with by placing a, a, a glass or plastic box filled with uh, sand, all fraction of sand and shale, and this is the plot that they have come up with. So the NMR can definitely be used by using this sort of plot to identify what is the percentage of shales and what is the percentage of sand in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a reservoir? So uh, <clears throat> another approach is the anisotropy uh, petrophysic approach, which means we are trying to we are going to measure RV and RH using our logging tools, and then uh, from that we will find we will uh, determine what is the fraction of the sand. And what is the fraction? Of, what is the true residue of the sand? And then come up with the uh, saturation computation based on R sand and porosity. How do we do that? We can use this sort of plan, uh, plot, which is called uh, uh, Shirley Klein Klein Shirley plot, to uh, to determine R V and R H. Another plot from Slumberger, which is a modified uh, plot similar to what we have seen before here. So sorry, sorry, I uh, apologize for the quality of the slide again. We cannot see the, the axis very well, but there are plots like that which are available in the uh, softwares. Using that, we can come up with RV, RH, and RSEN. So here is an, an example done in West Africa. We have a, a gamma ray log here. We have a density neutron and we have resistivity. Which is so using this approach, we have, they have already back calculated what, we, what is RV and RH. So the RV is in red color, RH is in uh, blue color. So using those uh, uh, logs now, this is the evaluation because this is an anisotropy uh, index. If you go back to the uh, if you go back here. In, uh, the in anisotropic index is the RV divided by RH. So this is what is being indicated here. And if you look at the resistivity logs here, the the blue is the RH and the red is the RV and the the black one is the measured resistivity. Sorry, the black one is the uh, recomputed R sand. So, so in this in this section here, which is probably water bearing zone in here, the uh, the R sand, RV, and RH are more or less tracking one another. But when it comes to this uh, uh, shady section in here, we see that the uh, R sand and RV are on top of one another, overlying, and RH is lower. So if we had been using the RH as usual to compute our water saturation, we are going to get this water saturation, which is shown in, in the blue color, and it's going to be pessimistic. And if we use the R sand, which has been uh, uh, computed from these RV and RH and use the R sand to compute our water saturation. Now we have a big improvement on the saturation, which is the, the, the black color here. So those data points are being plotted on here. 
Then from that, we can compute the fraction of the shale. We can compute the uh, SW and the arsen. Uh, in the same well, when we ran, the, when the NMR was run, and then using the NMR analysis, this is what it looks like. Okay. So fraction of sand in this, this uh, 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 what you, purple color, NMR, the fraction of sand computed from NMR, and the proxy of sand computed from NMR, and then this is evaluation based on NMR. Combine them all together. So we have uh, five sand from NMR and five sand from Thomas Tiber. Here is five, uh, the, the uh, fraction of sand from NMR and the fraction of sand from RVRH. So they are tracking quite well. So which indicates that the NMR can be used to determine the uh, fraction of sand and fraction of shale. And here is the, uh, the T2 distribution uh, displayed in, uh, in uh, variable density log. So looking at the, uh, the final uh, 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 hydrocarbon thickness uh, measurement, it's a 40 feet, across a 40 feet uh, zone interval. The RH measured, if you are using the RH method, the hydrocarbon feet is 23 hydrocarbon feet. Then netto gross is 0.34. If you are using RVRH method, now the hydrocarbon feet becomes 38 which means 65% increase. And netto gross now becomes 62%, it's all increase of 82%. And if you use NMR, the hydrocarbon feed becomes uh, 41. Okay. So looking at, if we had been using the RH, like uh, what we have been doing before, using the measured resistivity alone, we're only going to get 30, 23 feet of hydrocarbon pay. But if you are using the RVRH method, we, we are getting now 38, 38 feet. And if you use the NMR, it's about 41, so not much, not much difference from there. And you look at the image logs here, they are really uh, thinly laminated the sands. So this is the example from Malaysia, which is using the, the, the same set of logs which I've shown at the very beginning of the talk. So we have a gamma ray log here. We have the resistivity logs. Now we have the, the density and neutron here. Here, the density is here. The neutron is in, uh, in the turquoise color here. The density is in red color. Then the standard formation evaluation shows that we have a whole bunch of hydrocarbon here, no doubt, because the resistivity is very, very high. And we got good porosities, and even slight crossovers on the density and neutron, depending on how you plot it. And then here, over this interval, is very shaly from the density neutron and resistivity is low. So in the conventional standard formation evaluation, we hardly have any hydrocarbon in here. But when you start to compare with uh, porosity from the core, we have a very good match in here. We have very good match in here. And then by uh, doing this uh, thin bed analysis, we can enhance the porosity of the, uh, of the uh, uh, evaluated porosity. And we start to get a better match than the standard evaluation. Then uh, here is the saturation computed using the, uh, the uh, thin bed in a, uh, in a evaluation method. We have a very good match with the coal, uh, because these are, uh, these, are, these are water saturation using um, uh, Dean Stark measurements. So we have a very good um, uh, match in the hydrocarbon zone. We have less, but still a lot better than what we had before. So here is a core image with the under under white light and under, under UV light. So we do see that in the core image, we see that there are hydrocarbons uh, bearing streaks. And the image lock in section section here shows that there are thinly laminated sections in here. So if you do resolution, in, that was uh, what you call the bulk analysis using the standard logs and using the uh, RVRH from the Thomas Tiber plot and the, uh, and the uh, Shirley and Klein plot. Here we are using a resolution enhancement by using uh, the image log to enhance our resolution of the gamma ray, resolution of the resistivity log, and the resolution of the porosity log. In Slumberger, they call it sharp analysis, and I'm sure the other uh, contractors can do uh, the resolution enhancement like, like Slumberger does here. So if you are using the, 
the sharp analysis to enhance the resolution of the logs and use these enhanced uh, uh, measurements to compute. This is a thin bed formation evaluation. This is a standard uh, FE, and we do see that we are getting an uh, even better match on the porosity and better match on the permeability and the, and the saturation. So, <clears throat> comparison of uh, uh, formation evaluation, standard formation evaluation, here core and image, and here is the uh, enhanced uh, uh, formation evaluation using the guided by the image log. So if you compare the uh, thicknesses here now, the uh, previously, if you look at the conventional evaluation, we, 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 only, we don't have much uh, uh, NAPIA here, but with the enhanced image, now we have NAPIA increase of 78%, average porosity increased by 44%, average oil saturation increased by 29%, VCLA decreased by 56%, uh, average uh, intrinsic permeability increased by 74%, porosity times height increased by 79%, uh, the hydrocarbon pay thickness increased by 58%. In the, in the uh, thick sand section here, there uh, is not much difference. The net pay increase only about 3%. Uh, porosity doesn't increase very much. The SO doesn't increase very much. The clay has in, uh, increased even, in fact, a little bit more because the thin, the, uh, the image can detect now the, the thinly laminated shales, so it increases the, uh, the, the shale volume. So there is a slight decrease in the permeability and uh, a bit improvement in the uh, phi H and a bit improvement in the hydrocarbon uh, pay thickness. So in summary, the two fundamental approaches to thin bed analysis, bulk and isotropic analysis provides rapid evaluation of thin bedded pays and evaluation of very thinly laminated uh, reservoirs. High resolution analysis allows for conventional petrophysical workflows to be applied in thin bed reservoirs and provides links to productivity. Largest uncertainty in hydrocarbon pore volume thickness is due to lack of sensitivity to sand layer resistivities. Vertical receivity measurements are key to reducing uncertainty in any thin bed analysis approach. So as we saw on the comparison, the, uh, in the thinly laminated sands, actually the resistive of sand is very much close to the RA, RV rather than the RH. Now, let me show you some two examples, which has been two studies which have been done by Mr. Leong and he was kind enough to give me his slides. So outline of this presentation will be Identification of the thinly laminated sands by using Thomas Tiber cross plots, quantification by doing resistivity modeling, and then he will give you, show us the examples. So this is a Thomas Tiber uh, plot where we have we can plot it against a V shale or we can plot it against a gamma ray log here. Here the gamma ray is plotted in reverse scale, which means decreasing gamma ray here, increasing gamma ray to the left, decreasing gamma ray to the right. So which means and then the porosity is increasing porosity upwards. So here we have a sand point, sand point here, we have a shale point here, and we have a, a, a dispersed uh, shale point here. So from here, from this triangle, here is increasing dispersed shales from the sand to the shale point downwards. And here we have a increase in shale lamination in this direction. So again, this is the Thomas Tiber plot, but plotted the other way around now. So, uh, so the laminate, laminated intervals will be plotted in this upper portion here, and the dispersed clays will be plotted around here. Okay. So the Thomas Tiber triangle is a plot of two response and Thomas Tiber triangle. It requires the selection of the endpoints, which is the selection of the the sand point, the shale point, and the dispersed shale point, and so forth. It reveals quantitatively the presence of hydrocarbon, the presence of laminated essential sequences, and rough assessment of the reservoir quality. So this is the actual well being plotted on the, it's a, plotted on geolog. So it's plotted uh, on this Thomas Tiber plot. And see, we see that in this uh, uh, example here, most of the, uh, uh, the shales are actually dispersed pore filling clays because they are plotted on the dispersed uh, shale line here. Not much of lamination in here. What is the effect of the sand and shale lamination on resistivity? We have discovered, we have covered that before already. So the RV, RH, which is measured in the horizontal direction, is 
combination of all these uh, uh, layers, and it is being represented as uh, as the uh, resistivities in parallel. And whereas the vertical resistivity, when because the current has to go across all of these uh, uh, bodies here, so it is a resistivity in in series. This is a series resistivity equation. If you remember your high school physics. So, parallel resistivity model because we are in the when we are evaluating a uh, laminated reservoir, we are going to use the uh, the parallel resistivity resistivity model. So in this here, in this example, in this uh, uh, equation here, where one over R H is equal to volume of sand laminar divided by resistivity of sand plus volume of shale laminar divided by shale resistivity. So let's assume, in for an example, R sand is 10 ohms. And our shale in the horizontal direction is one ohm. And assuming that we have a uh, sand uh, fraction is the same as shale fraction of 50% or 0.5. If we solve this equation here, we find out that our H is going to be 1.8 ohms. The actual R sand is 10 ohms. So if we are going to use R H of 1.8 ohms, we are going to be grossly underestimating the hydrocarbon potential of the, of the sand body. So if we, in this example here, so if we use this R, RH, which is the apparent resistivity measured by the tool, 1.8 ohms, and assuming that we have got a, a certain porosity and we, and we compute using Archie's equation, if we have porosity of 24%, the SW is going to be 84%. If we have 20% porosity, SW is going to be 100%. And if we are, if we are able to measure the sand resistivity, which is actually the 10 ohms, we are going to get SW of 32% when the porosity is 24%, and SW of 39% when the porosity is 20%. So the whole purpose of the low resistivity, low contrast study or the evaluation of thin bed is to get back the R sand to get the, the true or as close to true uh, value of the water saturation. So just for completeness sake, if we say that we just take the average of the 10 ohm and the one ohm, we come up with 5.5 ohm and we compute the saturation, we get about 45% for 24% porosity, 54% for 20% porosity. So when we're doing resistivity modeling, what we are trying to do now is that we are trying to, uh, we will determine what is the, uh, the shale laminar, volume of shale laminar, and then we get the volume of, uh, sand laminars and uh, we have measured resistivities so we can re if we know the shale uh, resistivity we can back calculate what should be the r sand resistivity okay. so the inverse step of calculating sand resistivity from the norm normal resistivity or apparent resistivity is called resistivity inversion or resistivity modeling so how do we do that we use these equations to compute the uh, back the uh, r, r sand and rh and rv and r sand so, <clears throat> so here we are taking into account the uh, the the, uh, the dip angles or the angle between the the dip of the formation and the deviation angle of the of the well. <clears throat> it's a two-step process. So here uh, we were using a tech lock from Slumberger. So for laminated shear volume and sand file calculation, it will be using Thomas T model and then. Uh, we can we can get uh, v, v lamina and porosity of the sand. For hydrocarbon saturation, we'll be using resistivity inversion or model, forward modeling, and we get RV, RH, and R sand. And then using R sand, uh, we can we can use or we can use R sand to recompute your saturations. So I'm not going to go through all these uh, steps now. Let's go straight to the example. So in this particular well here, <clears throat> so. We have got a density neutron uh, uh, being plotted on this new standard density neutron cross plot. Then uh, here, as usual, we have a shear point here, we have a sand point here. So uh, our data point is here. So from here, we can compute what is the the uh, the amount of uh, shear volume or what uh, what is the amount of the sand volume by using this uh, little equation here. Then <clears throat> we do residual modeling then we can come up with the saturation. So here we have a example here from well number four, apparent dip angle of the well is about 45 degrees and we do have a core or data in here. So in this little, little place here, we have a, this, this is the, the core image here. It's about 0.6 of a meter core. So in here we have 25 or 10 inches of sand bed 
and then 7.6 centimeter of sand bed in here, and then 17.8 centimeter or seven inches of sand bed in here. So these are sand laminas interbedded with shales. Okay. So this this uh, this study we, we computed the porosity of sand in red color. I don't know whether you can see it on here on red color in here. So it matches quite okay or quite good with the porosity from the core data. <clears throat> so again here, the same here, it's a good matching of the core porosity in purple dots. Purple dots are the core, por uh, uh, core porosities. And then low, low rep, low rep is the, is the low resistivity, uh, uh, the uh, low resistivity module from, uh, from TechLock. So we compute a porosity of the sand and they are matching very well. And this, this blue color is a standard evaluation. So which means that by using this low resistivity processing uh, uh, method, we are able to enhance the uh, porosity, we are able to uh, evaluate the porosity of the sand, which are matching quite well with the, with the porosity of the, uh, from the core. And using the porosity, we can, uh, we can get a better hydrocarbon saturation. So if you look at this ex uh, uh, example here, we have two sections here. This section here, we know that it's gas bearing sand, okay? But in this section here, which is rather shaly, the, the, the standard evaluation does not compute any hydrocarbon in here. So this is, okay, I'm not going to through the, the processing. I'll just go, go straight to uh, the evaluation. Sorry. <clears throat> so another example here, so if you look at in this section here, so here we have uh, saturation using the sand resistivity, and this is a normal saturation using the, the uh, Weissman-Smith equation. So that this is relatively shaly, uh, shaly interval here, but we do see that there's a big separation of gas in here. So by using the sand resistivity here, the, there's a big drastic improvement in the saturation of the, of the sand body here. Uh, even the, uh, the the porosity of the sand here. Here, the red color is the porosity of the sand, and the blue color is the standard uh, evaluated uh, porosity in this section here, because it's relatively shaly. So in this interval here, in the example here, these two sections have been re-evaluated using this uh, uh, thin, uh, thin, section, thin uh, sand evaluation, or the, <clears throat> Uh, LIRC evaluation, and then perforation had been added in here because we did a lot of study on all the old wells where the the uh, the LIRC sand had been bypassed initially because of the high water saturation, and reevaluated them using this uh, thin bed analysis approach, and come up with proposal for inter intervals to be reperforated or additionally perforated, and it has been additionally perforated, and it initially produced about 400, 450 barrels of oil with zero water cuts. And then uh, the latest at that time, latest, of course, it dropped because being uh, thinly limited sense, uh, the production it does not uh, sustain for a very long time. So after a couple of years, it went down to 184 barrels per oil, but still no water. Another example here where enhancements has been made using the uh, this hydrocarbon saturation based on uh, the uh, in the sand resistivity. So where there was no saturation before, we have now got hydrocarbon saturation. Where we have poor saturation before, we have enhanced uh, or better hydrocarbon saturation with the with the RSN. I'm going to skip all of this now. Same thing, example here, also big improvement. So in this particular example here, this uh, section, this interval was perforated and it produced uh, 400 barrels of oil. Before this, this was totally missed, and now. After perforating and with the enhanced uh, uh, evaluation, we managed to produce 400 barrels of oil in this interval here. So, in uh, the uh, thin bed analysis, the way that being, uh, we compute the hydrocarbon pore volume is the hydrocarbon pore volume is the summation of uh, the thickness of the net sand times porosity of sand times the 
uh, hydrocarbon saturation in the sand. Initially, in the conventional method, would be the thickness times porosity times water saturation, one minus water saturation. But in here, we are, we are using porosity of sand and we are using the net sand in here. So there's a little bit of difference in the, in the uh, uh, definition or computation of the hydrocarbon pore volume. Uh, here is a comparison of uh, porosity sand with the core volume. It's a very good match in here. Okay. Even in this section here, the uh, porosity from the uh, uh, thin, thin bed analysis is matching very well with the, the core porosity. So in the conclusion with this uh, case study one is essential laminar model gives low apparent resistivity. Using the apparent resistivity underestimates the hydrocarbon saturation in essential laminations. Thomas Tiber cross plus facilitates identification of thin, thin bed and sensual laminations. Thomas Tiber cross plus augmented with resistivity modeling sufficiently evaluate LRC quantitatively. Sand resistivity will be used in the saturation calculation instead of apparent resistivity. Hydrocarbon pore volume is now is defined as a summation of net sand thickness uh, poros, times porosity of the sand poros, times the saturation of hydrocarbon in the sands. Another example, here the uh, SW total from this uh, low resistivity pay analysis in the red color is matching very, very well or as close as possible with the uh, Dean Stuck SW measured, which, which shows that this me method of uh, LRC evaluation is, is a valid method. And the porosity also matching very well and the uh, saturation also matching very well. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, this is just uh, the Thomas Tiber plot with all the data points being plotted in there. And this is how we derive the uh, QV for this. In, for this uh, so here is the data point in the, in the shear client uh, uh, butterfly plot. So we have seen this already, same thing. So conclusions, the three axis resistivity logs, RV and RH enable derivation of, oh, sorry, in this, actually, in this example here, they have done both ways, done the standard LRC method as well as using the RV, RH methods. The uh, methods here, SW total from the red curve is derived from three axis resistivity logs, RV and RH, it matches very well with the Dean Stuck SW. So, here we have used the triaxial uh, induction resistivity log and using that triaxial resistivity, we uh, uh, model for, uh, inverted the resistivity to compute the R sand and then calculated the saturation and it matched very well with the Dean Stuck uh, measured uh, saturation values. So conclusion is the three axis resistivity logs enable derivation of RT sand and give accurate saturation of SW total of the sand as confirmed by the comparison of Dean Stuck results in well nine and shows good match with the SW sand. Using the same low rep program with conventional resistivity logs gives lower RT sand than the derived from RVRH log, hence higher SW sand which do not compare with the Dean Stuck results. The SW total sand derived from RVRH provide a good standard for comparison with SW derived from saturation height function. So in that, study, we also did some saturation height function. If you look at here, the, uh, the blue color is from saturation height. And the, the SW core is the black dots. And the SW teat is from low resistivity uh, uh, pay module. So using the conventional resistivity log, RD with low, low rep program, our porosity sand and VCLM are still can be derived and are still usable. So change, it is just strengthens the argument that we can use both approaches, the approach of the bulk volume analysis using the standard log and also using the, uh, the, the new generation resistivity tools, which is the triaxial resistivity or the multi-component uh, induction tool and come up with RVRH and RSEN and use that to compute the saturation. So that is the conclusion of the uh, presentation. But here I'm showing you uh, 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 some slides from the uh, presentation made by Dr. Lutz, uh, Dr. Lutz Ripe many years ago at the IPA uh, SEM, uh, conference in, in Indonesia. So where he recommended the various approaches to uh, evaluate LRC sands. So if we have a core data, this is how he proposes to uh, 
computer, SWIR, which is the original water saturation from core analysis. And this is the, his proposal to compute uh, irreducible water saturation using uh, well logs. And this is an example which has been shown already, I guess, uh, by Pat did it a couple of uh, months ago from one of our wells in, in Malaysia, where we have a very low resistivity sand, uh, about uh, one and a half to two ohms only. And uh, there is no, no uh, separation at all on the density neutron, but we have uh, a lot of, uh, we recover gas from the, the MDT. And when we perforated, we're able to juice, produce clean gas with no water at all. And we did some, uh, we took some core samples and did core analysis and our evaluation matches quite well with the core data. And here we have a uh, saturation from height function matching with the, uh, with the saturation, the problem with the standard saturation is the saturation is very high because it is actually because of, it's not because of lamination, it's because of the uh, amount of dispersed clays and silt inside the, inside the sand body itself. So we can't improve much, but still the saturation high function managed to uh, match the, uh, the uh, log, log. So the whole idea was because when we evaluated it well, the reservoir engineers were not very quite very happy with the uh, evaluation because we were showing about 60%, 70% water saturation, and the uh, well was producing uh, very clean gas and no water at all. But even the uh, the high function didn't improve much because it, that is what it is. So that 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 has been already presented in this uh, forum. And here, another example where the NMR was able to uh, identify the hydrocarbon bearing interval, even though the resistivity was very low. The resistivity in the shady interval was about 0.4 to 0.9 ohm only, and the water saturation of about 50 to 80 percent. NMR was able to identify very high amount of bound water, and then if they are not movable, so, and this interval actually produced 2,000 barrels of oil with no water cut. So there are two good uh, reference books which we can uh, refer to, which is the one from AAPG, the Petrophysical Evaluation of Hydrocarbon Pore Thickness in Thinly Bedded Plastic Reservoirs by all these authors from Exxon Mobil. And another one is the Detecting Hydrocarbons and Low Resistivity and, and Environments by Dr. Uh, Pierre Berger from Slumberger. And uh, this is an old book. I don't know whether it's still available or not, but this book from AAPG is still available. So these are two very good uh, uh, reference uh, materials. So that ends our, my presentation. Thank you for being patient and not falling asleep. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Pogoki. Uh, very good presentation. And uh, for the next session, we will get the uh, question, yeah? And there are 11 questions in chat box. Maybe... Uh, chat, chat box, okay, let's look at it. But I will try to read and uh, you can answer if you want to uh, show some of slides, it's, it's okay. From the first question is from Pinar, the first one. Which model would give best or close estimate of net sand thickness over the laminated interval in comparison with a uh, core carb? Okay, okay. Excuse me, what was the question again? Okay. Question from Bernard. Which mm -hmm. model would give best estimate of net sand thickness of a delaminated sand in comparison with uh, core data? If, if you want to compare with core data, my opinion will be the, the image log would be a better one because the image log is uh, looking at very thin bed. So you may be able to uh, enhance it and you might be able to get a better sand thickness. But the only problem with the the, the, the image analysis that is also subjective. So you are trying to em enhance the log. So depending on how you process it, you can, I mean, pardon, for, pardon me for saying that you can make a sand look like a shale or shale look like a sand. So, so you have to be really careful and uh, you probably have to be guided by the core. The core will be the ground tool to tell you where, is, where the sand laminars are and where the shale laminars are. Okay, so uh, image from, image lock, yeah. Is the the image would be a better one, yes. Net, net thickness. Okay, and the second question uh, from Ardia. Based on your experience, what is the best perforation strategy to produce thin bed uh, reservoir? Bed perforating, uh, I mean, best perforating strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, so, maybe since, 
yeah. very low permeability or low yeah. performance. Uh, so, uh, so, so I think for, for thin pads, uh, because since you cannot do selective perforation, you have to probably have to shoot the whole interval. Okay. Because uh, the contribution will be coming from all all of them together, so you have to you have to do a blanket perforation. Okay, so selective uh, perforation, right? Not the whole of the perforation. No, no, no. You, no, you have to you have to perforate the whole interval. Okay. You cannot do selective because uh, there is no way that you're going to perforate only in the sand and you're you're going to miss the shale. So you have to do a perforation of the whole interval, as shown in one of the example. You have to perforate the whole interval. Otherwise, uh, your contribution will be uh, from the from the sands will be low. Okay, so, uh, but okay, uh, according to you, uh, which one is better? If we perform all the interval, but we use the hydraulic fracturing, or the still the single selective but without a fracturing? Just my curious. Uh, you you can fracture them if the sands are uh, competent enough because. It, just like uh, what we what people are doing in the in the shield in this, uh, uh, in the shield industry yeah. if your sand is competent enough of course you can perf you can you can frack it yeah. but uh, I, i'm not too sure whether it's how much going to improve because uh, you are you are, you are producing from the sand themselves so you do have you do because they are too so thin that you are you are missing them but you the sand board the sand laminar themselves, they have as good a porosity and as good a permeability as the big sand bodies anyway so mm -hmm. I'm not too sure whether you're going to improve uh, by fracking it because uh, the, the, you're going to the you're perforating the whole interval of the the, the the thinly laminated interval and the contribution is coming from the porous and permeable sands themselves. So the improvement made by fracking, I'm not too sure whether it's going to be drastic compared to just leaving as it is. You know. Okay. Also, from your example, from your slide, uh, we see that the sand interval is still still so a good. Porosity, yes, yeah. yes. It, yeah. it still, it still goes, uh, shows a very good porosity. Yes. In fact, uh, in some, some, some spots, the core in, the core's uh, porosity from those sand intervals are even b better than the, uh, the, the thick sand body. Okay. So uh, this recommendation that the selective interval preparation is uh, better, lah. Yeah. It's the yeah, best. that should be good enough because uh, why, why, why do you want to spend more money by fracking it? Okay. Okay. On the next question, third question from Muklis. In early your slide, core data indicate high porosity in thinly mm -hmm. laminated sand, almost yes. the same porosity in good sand. Is that mean mm -hmm. that the reservoir quality is almost the same? Maybe uh, he mean that if we have a laminated sand in the same sand in the laminated sand, still uh, same the porosity quality. I would think so because uh, uh, it, it is these are these become thinly laminated because of the deposition itself. I think the quality of the sand will probably be the same as the quality of the sand in the in the thick bodies. You know, it's just that uh, because of the way that these formations are deposited in a turbidite environment where you have uh, uh, the uh, one layer of one layer of sand, one layer of uh, shale depositing on one another, uh, but the sand quality itself, I think they are probably about the same as the the, the thick beds. Okay. Okay. That's why when they do, that's why when they do the sharp analysis, they are assuming that the the porosity of the the sand is more or less the same as the porosity in the in the thick 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 beds. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, for the next question from Andri, is it still possible to do the petrophysical analysis on the thin bed potential once the well was only have a standard wire line locks? And routine core data without image and also without NMR data, just the conventional and standard lock. Yes, it can be done. That's what uh, what I showed that uh, Mr. Leong has done. We had those wells, our old wells, with very, 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 very basic uh, resistivity, like you no know, one or two resistivity logs, the gamma ray, a density neutron. But we, mm -hmm. if we, uh, we can do analysis by using the uh, using the Thomas Tebow approach and the uh, resistivity modeling. But we still need to uh, verify it by actually doing a perforate uh, by perforating the zone to see whether they are productive or not. And another issue with this uh, evaluation of thin bed reservoir is that sometimes to compute for a, for a geologist to compute their volumes, they need to know whether these sands are extensive or not. You know? So that is the problem that we face. In the well evaluation itself, by using these uh, standard uh, logs, we were able to enhance the uh, the, uh, the evaluation. But whether the production is going to sustain or not, whether the, those sand laminations are extensive or not, we do not know. Okay. That is the problem when they try to map it across the whole field. Okay. 
So in the well itself, yes, can be done. Mm. Can be done, yeah. Okay, so for the next question, five question from Abid. From your own, own experience, which method is in the best practical sense? Is of use the better represent of hydrocarbon in pin bed uh, reservoir? Was it high resistivity method using NMR or image or using RTRH method? Okay, uh, I do not have much experience uh, with the NMR or on the thin beds, but I have uh, seen a few or a few of the uh, triaxial resistivity, and uh, these do seem to give. Uh, 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 better results than because if you are if you are relying on uh, standard logs, you are trying to uh, enhance it by playing with the parameters, which means you are manipulating the data. Whereas so when you are when you have run the triaxial resistivity, you are actually measuring the uh, the RV and uh, no, not measuring the RVRH, but you are, you are computing the RVRH, and from there you you get an R sense. So to me, it will be a better approximation of the R sense than getting it from the uh, the forward modeling of the resistivity from standard logs. Mm. So I would I would prefer the uh, because the uh, the triaxial resistivity will also give you a standard resistivity. So if you are if you are if you can afford to run it, because they are not cheap locks. Right? If, if you can afford to run it, then you you already have the the, the way to recompute your R sand. Okay. So that will probably give you a better estimation of your hydrocarbon. Okay. Maybe I, I want to add uh, some point just for my sure. story. If we didn't have RP, RH lock to degenerate R sand, can we uh, propagate the RP, RH maybe from the pseudo RP, RH if we have uh, maybe uh, very high deviated well, Kokogi. If we have a uh, very deviated well, so maybe we can calculate the pseudo light RVRH between red arson. Is it possible or not? Or didn't you? Uh, it's difficult to say because we have tried. We have tried what we have tried is that, you know, in the, in the old wells, if we have a, a, a lateral log and an induction log at the same well, in the same well, we, would, we, did, we did try to get RV and RH because uh, the induction log tends to measure uh, in the horizontal direction, so it's RH. The, the lateral log tends to measure the current which passes through all the formations, so it is sort of measuring an R, RV. So from there, we tried to get R sand, but we were not too successful. But uh, I have not tried the method you were saying, but, but if it is coming from the uh, standard log, uh, I doubt that you'll be able to get uh, RV, RH from the, uh, from, from the normal log, unless you do the modeling. Okay, okay. So we will uh, continue on the next question from the uh, Muklis. Yeah, <clears throat> dealing with thinly laminated uh, sand evaluation, which one is more recommended to use the probabilistic or deterministic for the standard physical evaluation? Oh, for for the thinly laminated sand, I don't think there is there is a there is a point to do a. a so what you call probabilistic. Actually, probabilis people call it probabilistic. Actually, it's not a probabilistic. It is what we call equation solver. You're yeah. trying to solve simultaneously for the volumes of uh, clay, volume of sand, volume of uh, hydrocarbon, and so forth. So it is just another method of uh, computing the volume. So it's, I don't think it's going to increase the uh, increase the uh, uh, resolution of or of the evaluation because at at every point you are still using the same data sets. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in a deterministic approach, you are using the same density, same ten neutrons, same resistivity, and computing it step by step to compute your V shell, porosity, and then saturation. In the uh, in the uh, probabilistic or the equation solver method, you are at the same level. You are using the same density, same neutron, and same resistivity, but you are using a different approach to compute your. Uh, uh, volume of clay, volume of sand, and, and porosity and saturation. So it is the same. Only thing is the method of arriving at the results. So I don't think it is going to be helpful in doing your thin bed analysis. That's my personal opinion. So okay, so so the probabilistic and the determinism is in the same way. Uh, from the it, will, it will probably give you the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Provided you choose a provided you choose the same because the problem with the probabilistic method of uh, evaluation is that it's an equation solver. Right, so you are assuming that once you get your uh, inverted log, the same as your input log, you say that you have arrived at the solution. It may not be a unique solution. So, depending on how you choose your input parameter, you can come up with different evaluations. Right. So, okay. uh, but it is not definitely it is not a thin bed analysis uh, uh, method. Yeah. 
Okay. On the next question from Ahmed Rasen. How an MR measure waiver? It's under the resolution of the team bed. Uh, NMR has a better because it's is it, it's a better resolution than the standard log, but the, the it is only looking at a very very shallow into the formation. Okay. <clears throat> so resolution wise, yes, it is uh, is better than the standard logs, unless you go and process the density and neutrons to do a resolution match and enhance it. Then it is definitely a standard density and neutron will be has a has a lower resolution than the NMR. Okay, so the best way is on the adding the is NMR, NMR uh, to me, it, it would be better suited to identify whether you have a, you have a sand zone, a, a thinly laminated zone here, but whether you contain hydrocarbon or not, NMR may be a better uh, indication than the density in a neutron. Because okay. in the density in neutron, because they, they cannot resolve the thin beds, you're going to miss the, uh, what you are looking for is a crossover for the, for the gas sands and the uh, overlying for density in neutron in, uh, in hydrocarbon, in, in oil zones. So that may be missed because the, the, the sands are thinly laminated, but uh, because the NMR has a little bit better resolution, it may be able to, uh, to uh, detect the hydrocarbon in there. And we have seen some examples, uh, real life example, where we have totally missed the uh, hydrocarbon on the density in neutron, but NMR helped us to, uh, to detect that there is a uh, hydrocarbon in that zone. Okay. And the next question from Debbie. Based on your experience, what is the best method or equation to calculate water saturation in LRLC? In bed reservoir using conventional log. Uh, if you are going to use conventional log, all of the equation they will give you an average number. So you, if, if you evaluate in LRSC environment or when you see an LRSC in the thin bed uh, intervals, you do have to enhance your resistivity and the in the porosity of the sand. Otherwise, no matter which equation you use, you're going to come up with the average value. Yeah. The worst case will be the Archie's equation because uh, you've got a lot of shales inside, so you are not going to be able to account for the shales. So you're going to resort using an Indonesia saturation equation, or you're going to use Waxman Smith or the uh, other uh, saturation equation. But they are all going to give you an average reading because the resistivity is an average of the of the of the yeah. beds. So you're going to end up with the same. So yeah. unless you go, you resolve that thin bed, you won't be able to get. Uh, uh, better results. Okay. Next question from Adit. In your experience, is it in bed with hydrocarbon is always related to high gas reading from the matlock? Not necessarily. I think depends on uh, depends on what is the hydrocarbon in your zone. You know? So of course, uh, if you have uh, if you have gas in your thin beds, of course, uh, when you drill through that. You will get uh, uh, you will get your uh, your gas uh, re returning to the surface, but uh, if it is oil, I don't I don't think you'll see much gas in there unless of course you have a very high amount of uh, gas in the sands. But I'm I, I'm not a uh, I'm not a, uh, an expert on mud logging, so I won't be able to answer it uh, definitely. Okay. But I don't I don't think you probably might miss it because even a um, uh, conscientious mud logger, if the sands are lemon, very thinly laminated, when you when you do the sample picking, you might be you might miss the, those uh, those sands. Okay, and also depend on uh, our drilling fluid, yeah, on the density fluid. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely yes. Because normally, if you are, if you are drilling with uh, oil-based mud, what might happen is that uh, whatever gas has been released from those thin beds might uh, might uh, get dissolved in the oil, and you might not see it. Okay. Okay. For the next question from Ramadan. How to develop data analysis trend for a sax, for, sax, for successful hydraulic fracturing hydrocarbon treatment? And second question is been, based on your opinion, how does the addition of steam lower the hydrocarbon partial pressure? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch your question. Okay. The first question is how to develop data analysis trend for a, sax, for a successful hydraulic fracturing hydrocarbon treatment? Maybe you mean that uh, how can we develop the fra fracturing operation in low resistivity uh, treatment from the resistivity reservoir? 
on the so for 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 fracturing it will depend on your you do have to do a, a geomechanical analysis first of all to to see that is is, is can you fracture it or not because to 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 be able to fracture you must have a brittle material inside right so here we have integrated sand shale layers so if the shale layers do not have enough uh, brittle material inside you might not be able to even frack it if you can frack it you won't, you won't be able to hold it it will close it. the fractures will close the, the, the reason that uh, the shale industry is so successful in fracking is that even though they are called shales, they, have, they do have a high amount of uh, uh, brittle material inside there. They've got a high amount of quartz, they've got a high amount of uh, calcite in there. So they are able to frack it and keep them open. So for thinly laminated sands, if you, are, if you, are, uh, sand body, you have sand bodies, but you, the sand bodies are so thin and the, 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 the bedding the beds above and below are shales, and if they are ductile, you won't be able to frack it. So it won't be, uh, the, the criteria will be the geomechanics, whether the formation is frackable or not. So I don't think it will, will depend on the uh, standard uh, LRC evaluation. So you, you won't be able to guide with the uh, LRC. You will be able to see that it's got hydrocarbon, it's got high, sizable amount of hydrocarbon, but whether it's going to be frackable or not, you won't be able to tell it unless you do a uh, geo geochemical uh, geomechanical studies. Okay. On the next question, based on your experience, how to combine this method for thinly bed in water wet area or oil wet area? Or maybe in the reservoir characterization. Mm -hmm. The thin uh, this reservoir is independent in water wet. Yes. On the oil yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a tough question because. Uh, uh, all my experience been working in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, Asia. Most of our reservoirs around this area are all water wet, okay. at least uh, initially water wet. So the uh, I have not seen I have not seen uh, this being a problem. But if it is uh, oil wet, what happen what may happen is that your producibility will definitely be uh, reduced because uh, could be the reservoir being oil wet. It will be more difficult for the hydrocarbons to come out, especially coming from uh, very thin reservoirs. But I really do not know. And uh, I've seen some example uh, from uh, uh, oil wet reservoirs where the uh, the uh, saturation high function is 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 is, is uh, a little bit weird because uh, the uh, it, it doesn't behave like a normal uh, the uh, uh, capillary pressure data. So. The, the cap pressure might might help, but I am not too sure how how it, this is going to affect your evaluation of the uh, the sands which are oil wet. Sorry, okay. I cannot answer that question. No. Okay, okay. So for the next question, is it possible to measure resistivity in ten percent from core plug in lab in order to validate the resistivity value from log? To me, it might be difficult unless you can you can uh, remove the shaley part. I, normally, in a core plug measurement, it is a one inch, one and a half inch diameter, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you have sand uh, laminar which are even thinner than that, I do not know. I do not think you will be able to measure it because you are going to still do a, a measurement which is the average of the the bulk volume of the, oh, the core plug itself. So, you won't be able to do it, no, unless. There is some way that you can isolate the, the, the sand lamina itself and then you might be able to do it. Yeah, because core plug is only one sample, yeah? And yes, yeah, one, yeah, mm -hmm. one sample. And in that sample, you will have a mixture of uh, sand and... Uh, uh, if it is so thin, you're going to have a mixture of uh, shale lamina and the seminar, sand lamina itself inside there. So when you're measuring the resistivity from the two ends of the core plug, you, you will be only reading the average of the, the resistivity. Okay. The next question, the resistivity modeling is the better than conventional analysis for thin bed. Is this method can be applied for low resistivity due to sensitivity clay mineral exists in the thin bed? Thank you. Yeah, definitely. If you if you want to improve your your hydrocarbon pore volume or calculation, you do have to do LRC or method because otherwise the standard uh, evaluation method you will you're going to definitely miss it. But the problem is that you need to have the proper software to do that. You can probably do it on a, on a spreadsheet if you want, but it's going to be very time consume, consuming. So you need to have the special packages to enhance your, your evaluation. Okay. And it is also time consuming. Okay. Okay, for the next question from 
from Doni. Have you tried FVLSA, Volumetric Laminated Sand Analysis, that proposed by Exxon Mobile from Daniel Dalberg? Is there any commercial software that apply this method? Um, there are many uh, commercial uh, software. You know, if you look at uh, Geolog, they have uh, what you call uh, uh, LASI, uh, Laminated uh, Sandy Shield Interpretation. Uh, Shell has their sandwich problem before, uh, program before. Slumberger in the tech log, they have the low wrap. So a lot of companies are offering these uh, uh, laminated sand shield uh, evaluation methods. So I'm sure Exxon has their own, Shell has their own, uh, uh, Geolog has, has it. So you can develop your own if you want. Even in the even in the uh, reference book that I showed just now from the AABG, there is a, a, a if you if you look at it in the book, there is a Excel spreadsheet program that they have provided where you can simu where, where you can simulate and try and get back the sand resistivity from uh, from a normal resistivity log, provided you know what is your R shield and, and your uh, and and, uh, and your uh, V shield. But most of the most, most of the method is it true that we should to have a uh, vertical resistivity and horizontal resistivity Kobe. most of uh, most of the method or there is some method that we don't need the RV or RH. Uh, in, 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 the, in, in the example that I mentioned just now, the, the, the excess pressure from Exxon, you don't need it. You, as long as you know what is your shear resistivity and you have the apparent resistivity which is measured by the uh, by the uh, the tool and mm -hmm. uh, you know what is your shape volume and then uh, what they do is that they do a simulation and when you have a you you change your parameters you put your you, and you come up with an r sand value when you put back in there you reproduce your log and if it matches your original log that is your solution for the r sand so it's the iterative process so you this is one for, for this is to be used with the standard uh, logs where we don't have the rv and rh you know? because rv and rh measurements came about not too long ago you know? okay. so uh, this method was uh, i mean developed a long time ago so that's the method that people can use as the iterative process to to get to get back the the uh, sand resistivity okay of course the, the assumption is that the assumption is that you must know your Shear resistivity. The, the problem with knowing the shear resistivity is that sometimes the the resistivity of the shear above may not be the same of the same as the resistivity of of the shear inside your reservoir itself. Yeah. That's possible. Oh, oh, it, it's very possible. Yeah, for the different value between the shear in our reservoir resistivity and the, the other cell. Yeah, yeah. If that happens, then your assumption is wrong. So, which means if you compute your R sand from there using the shear, shear above, that's what people usually do. You take the shear above and you took the shear resistivity, or you take the shear above and you take that uh, density neutral on the shear and you come up with a volume. Sometimes it's quite all right, but sometimes it could be wrong. Okay. Okay. Thank you. For the next question from Alam. In your definition, does thinly laminated sand has the same meaning with Sally sand in terms of low resistivity reservoir? Uh, so the, if I answer, understand the question, if your if your sand has a low resistivity, it could be that your your shields are dispersed. You no, know? if your shields are dispersed, there is no way that you are going to be able to compensate for the lamination because the way that it's been the, the clays are distributed is being dispersed. So it is you are measure, making the measurement of the combination of the shields and the sand in the sand body itself. So you, I don't think you can make much improvement on the resistivity for this uh, LRC method to work. You must make sure that you are, you are you are dealing with laminated shales, not not dispersed clays. So okay. dispersed clays are going to to mess up all your all your logs. Also, you're going to have an effect on the density and neutron, and mainly the resistivity is going to be reduced. And there's no way that you can compensate for it. No. Okay. On the next question, in in bed reservoir reservoir, if it contain oil, is it always so oil so in upping? And the gas reading data always much higher. If, if, if you are showing about what, uh, thin bed resistivity, yeah. If, if you have if you have high, uh, uh, oil in your reservoir, even though it may be thin bed, in your cuttings, if you are careful about it, you should be able to see the you should be able to see your oil staining on your cuttings. No, of yeah. course, the only problem is that you probably do not know exactly uh, where it is because. Uh, being a thin, a thinly better layer, they're all they're going to, when they come up to the surface, they're going to be all mixed up. You know? Okay, we move to the another question. In low in low rep tech of module, 
is the resistivitization calculation improved by inversion method? If yes, how does it work? Yes, it, uh, as I showed you in the example that uh, I did not do the work myself, it was done by Mr. Leong, and he has demonstrated that by using the low rep module in the tech log, it does improve the, uh, the, uh, the, the RSN. Even though you do not have the, uh, the, the RVRH from the triaxial resistivity, you can still use the standard method, but you can enhance it by doing the, this uh, uh, resistive inversion. Of course, uh, you, there are a lot of things that uh, which I, which you need to be input there. You need the the, the angle of the uh, of the bedding planes. Normally, it's okay if your if your uh, dip angles are relatively uh, small, and uh, the well is vertical, so it should not be a problem. But if you start to have a very high dip, you do need to have the, those angles properly because if you look at the equation, the the angle theta is there. That the angle theta is the difference between the uh, the dip angle and the deviation of the well. So depending on the, uh, how big the angle is, your correction is going to be uh, have a, a bigger or a lower effect on the inversion. Huh? So that 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 has to be uh, that has to be known, and it has to be known quite quite accurately, because otherwise the, 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 that will be another uncertainty that that's been introduced in the uh, inversion of the resistivity. Okay. Okay. On the next question from. Ihsan, I just add of using NMR on pin bed or solution analysis by using NMR T2 to compute volume fraction shell by versioning the T2 spectral in a volume method. I don't know, this is explanation of the question. Maybe this is explanation on the... Okay, I'll go to the slide. Or huh? Maybe you can... I can go, I can, I can go to the slide. slide huh? Okay. I think this is a slide. Okay, so this is the experiment that uh, Schlumberger made. So what they did was uh, on the NMR2 or the DRCMR2, they put a box, you know, which is, uh, I think it's a plastic box, filled with 100% sand, and then look at the, 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 the uh, T2 intrinsic and the diffusion plot, where the data is plotting. So the data is plotting here, but it's, it's filled with water. So there's no hydrocarbon inside there. So, so there's no hydrocarbon effect at all. So all the data points are plotting here. So this is 100% sand fraction, okay? Yeah. Then uh, you fill up with uh, uh, clays and then 10% sand fraction only. So that is where the points are plotting, okay? Then uh, you have 100% clays. This is where the points are plotting. So what they did was they vary the amount of uh, uh, sand fraction and the clay fraction, and they come up with this plot. And the, by using this plot, they, and looking at this uh, uh, this uh, T2, T2 and diffusion plot, they can back calculate what is the sand fraction and what is the shale fraction. So it, this is probably uh, the way that Slumberger has done it. Uh, I'm sure the other companies, also other service providers, will also be able to do some sort of similar method. So, of course, this needs processing to be done by the uh, service provider. I don't think uh, uh, an oil company will be able to do it because unless you are able to plot your own uh, T2 uh, diffusion plot yourself, you might not be able to. And also, you need to have this plot uh, being available or provided by the service company. Okay. And of course, this is also a niche application, if you like, you know. So first of all, you must have an NMR, and then then you need to have this uh, proper uh, cross plot with, for you to be able to do the uh, sand fraction, clay fraction analysis. Okay. Okay. For the next question from Ahmed Rashid. Oh, this is a lot of question. Maybe we can. Uh, I'm I'm yeah. going to charge ten dollars because you know. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask for one by one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why vertical resistivity is larger than horizontal resistivity in pin bed? Uh, why is it higher than? Because uh, it is, uh, if you look at the, uh, the equation here, ah. so if you look at this equation here, this is how, how it is uh, uh, presented, right? So RH is measured in the horizontal direction. So your current is being induced 
normally RH, uh, we are talking here, we are talking about induction resistivity. Eh? So mm -hmm. when you are talking about induction resistivity, you have a current loop flowing inside the formation and it's being affected by the uh, uh, overlying and underlying uh, beds, which are conductive beds, right? So uh, RH, now uh, this is the parallel equation. So when you solve a parallel equation, the, uh, the effect of the lowest resistivity will have the biggest impact which means the conductive shales will have the biggest impact on the, on the resistivity which has been measured, which means you are going to be always lower, low resistivity being measured in the horizontal direction. Whereas when you are looking at the RV measurement, the current has to pass through this, uh, this bed as a series resistor. And in a series resistor is a straight addition. It's a straight addition, so what is going to happen is that in the straight addition, the resistivity is always going to be the, the, the resistivity with the highest uh, component, a highest value will have the biggest impact. So if you compare this to your RV will always be higher than RSN because of this, the way that uh, the, the, the resistivities are combined. Okay. Uh, you, you can, you can uh, 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 imagine it. You put uh, a standard resistivity of 10 ohms and a shield resistivity of one ohm, and you combine this equation, and then you can solve this equation. You will always find that RV is higher than the RH. Okay. And because of the way that uh, the, 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 the tool is measuring and the, the way that the resistivities are combined, whether it's a parallel or a series. It's like electricity series, yeah, on the parallel. Yes, yes. Like that. Yes, yes, it is, it is uh, like what we studied in physics. Huh? So, yeah. resistivity is in parallel and resistance in, in, in series. Okay, so the next question, what is the best method to calculation SW in, maybe he mean the in bed reservoir, yeah? We have this explained. <clears throat> Yeah, the, the whole purpose of the thin bed evaluation is to derive the residue of the sand. You know? Once you get the residue of the sand, you can use a, a, a Shelley sand equation like a Wexman Smith equation or whatever your equation that you prefer, and uh, use uh, uh, and then compensate with the V uh, shale. But if you have sand porosity itself, you are able to uh, uh, compute a sand porosity, and you can even use uh, straight away Archie's equation. Because now you are looking at the residue of the sand and you are looking at the clean sand porosity only, so Archie's equation can be applied. Okay. On the next question, can you repeat how we correct resist standard resistivity, use, uh, sand resistivity to use hydrocarbon saturation? And if vertical resistivity and horizontal resistivity not available, how to calculate SW, you have to explain for it. You need to. Yeah. How how you we do that? We do the uh, the resistivity modeling. You, as I mentioned already, if you do not have RVRH measurement done with a, a triaxial uh, uh, measurement type of res uh, resistivity tool, we can do a resistivity modeling. Let's go and uh, look at it. I'm oh, sorry. So this is actually the equation that we're going to use. Huh? So. Uh, in this equation here, you need to determine what is the uh, sand laminar volume, shale laminar volume, that can be derived from thomas Stieber equation, okay? Then you do have to make an assumption, what is the shale resistivity in horizontal section? Uh, because in the, shale, in the shale section itself, you can have R shale in the horizontal direction, and you can also have an R sand in the vertical direction. Yeah? Because in the, even a so-called homogeneous shale interval, when the shale flakes are layered, they are layered horizontally. You normally will not layer with the shale, shale flakes uh, vertical direction. Now you are all going to be layered because when the formations were deposited, they were all deposited in a horizontal direction, right? So the shale flakes, also in the shale body itself, the RH in the shale will be always be lower than the RV in the shales. So you do have to make an assumption on the R shale horizontal. So that's one value that you have to input. Then you have this input R shale, and then this RH is, uh, uh, you assume that it is R apparent, which is the measured resistivity because you don't have anything else, then you can back calculate R sen. So once you have got your R sen back calculated by solving these two equations, then we can, uh, we can compute your saturation. Okay. On the next question, saturation heat function, mid core. What is the equation of it? And can you explain it in details? Maybe he asked you, calculate saturation water from the saturation function. Oh, the other one is there are many ways of uh, computing uh, 
saturation from high function. You oh, we have a leverage J function. You have a Thomas. Although you have a, what you call the the, uh, the 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 easiest way is uh, Cadiz equation. You know Cadiz formula. Uh, we don't need the core data for that. And uh, leverage J, you have uh, what you call the uh, scale Harrison. You have uh, there are many many methods. Uh, you have uh, what you call the uh, of, my, of uh, I can't recall often that many there are many methods. Okay. The, so uh, what you have to do is that you need to get uh, capillary pressure data from 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 core, data, core analysis. Then you get a you could do a, a curve fitting on the cap pressure, and then from there, from the curve fitting, you are going to plot the saturation uh, uh, versus the uh, cap pressure. Then you can come up with an uh, with an equation which correlates your saturation to the capillary pressure and high above the uh, free water level. And then from that you can compute, but it will also depend on your raw quality, which is a function of porosity and the permeability. Mm. Then uh, uh, then using any of these methods, leverage a function or the, uh, the, uh, the scale Harrison method, you can come up with uh, with a high function, which which which, which you can compute uh, water saturation in a reservoir above any height above the free water level, provided you know what is your porosity and uh, permeability mm -hmm. at that point. Okay, on the next, maybe this is like a case, yeah. In high water, in high water cut clean sand development wells, when we run resistivity log, then get RC, then we get water saturation trace. After perforation and production, water cut will be get higher than what resistivity indicated. This is kind of analysis misleading. What is your recommendation? Yeah. It, 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 it will depend because uh, if you are trying to compute water saturation in a shale interval, you are only always going to be very pessimistic you know, because your shale is going to reduce your resistivity. So sometimes, just because you are showing that uh, your SW is seventy percent or so, uh, it doesn't mean that it's all water. You, you you may be able to produce clean gas or clean oil if your water is irreducible. Even if the SW of seventy uh, percent is still irreducible water, then you are going to get clean hydrocarbon. But if your uh, computer SW is actually really show uh, due to the the content of water in the uh, 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 the free water in the in the formation, you are going to produce water from day one. Okay. So that's why we said that uh, it will uh, the, the 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 standard logs cannot differentiate between whether the, your water is going to be mobile or not. You're going to see low resistivity. You're going to compute a high water saturation. You do not know whether that is water is going to come out or not. That's why it helps if you have an, uh, a type of log like NMR to tell you that whether that water is bound water or free water. Okay. Next, can we see hydrocarbon limestone lamination instead of sand lamination? I have not worked much on on, on limestone, I, but I guess. Uh, the, Limestone can have, uh, I'm not too sure about lamination because the, the way that the limestone are built up, they are they are more like uh, in situ, right? So the yeah. way that the limestones are built, either, either from uh, from a pinnacle type of, uh, or, or or a platform carbonate, they, you do not have thin laminates like uh, you would see it in a, in a sandstone. But you do have some carbonates which behave like uh, uh, plastics. Mm. That's why uh, it's very difficult to compute uh, 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 what you call the uh, porosity, por porosity permeability transform in a, in a limestone because they don't behave like a, uh, a normal plastics. Okay. So uh, if, if there is such a thing as a laminated uh, uh, sense, uh, carbonate, probably you, you have to do some modeling also. Yeah. And the, another thing with the carbonate is that you, if you do, if you have micro porosity in the carbonates, that is going to bring down your resistivity. Yeah, because, uh, the, and, but if you go and perforate, you won't produce the water because it's, uh, all this water inside the micro porosity, it will never come out. But you, you are going to have a very pessimistic evaluation because of the micro porosities. Okay. For the next question, what is the cutoff of low resistivity pay carbonate? Maybe in the cut of resistivity. I think this is, yeah. Uh, that one I cannot answer because I do not know that. Okay. Again, I think, uh, the, uh, again, NMR might help, but the, but the problem with NMR and carbonates now is that what is the cutoff? 
because the cutoff can vary a lot. Whereas uh, for carbon for plastics, it is well known that if you cut off at 30 to 33 milli millisecond, you know that above that is free 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 uh, fluids. But in carbonates. It can be anything. It can be 70, 80, 90, depending on what type of carbonate you are in. So there is no actually a fast uh, rule of thumb to say this is my cutoff. We move to another question because we still have uh, many questions, yeah? In the long, uh, <laughs> okay. You still have five minutes only. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll be with the uh, committee. We still have maybe additional 20 minutes. Lah. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. I'm retired already, so my, I'm always free. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question: What is your calibration reference for SW derived from the resistivity modeling? I saw on your previous slide you try to compare with SW from Dinstar. Yes, Dinstar. From from Dinstar. But mm -hmm. Dinstar is the, me is the actual measurement. So people say that that is the ground truth. I do not know whether it's the ground truth or not, but people say that is a. So of course, uh, when you come up with the with a saturation, is a computation only, right? And also, even reservoir, even uh, resistivity inversion, is still still is a computation. So yeah. it, it needs to be validated. So the way to validate is if you have core data where you have Dinstar measurements, then well and good, you can you can you can calibrate it or you can corroborate it. Either that, if you do not have that, the only way will be to go and perforate it. Yeah. Or if you do not want to perforate it, you can go and do a straddle packer or a jewel packer, MDT or straddle packer, RCI or, or RDT, and then take a sample and then you can really see whether that section is going to flow or not. Right. Yeah, so because, yeah. all these computations are just computations. You have to have a, a real uh, uh, a sample or real uh, 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 something to to validate your evaluation. Because the reason is SW from the instruct result may not uh, quite good. They derive from the Salisen reservoir, and SW from head function has uh, uncertainty that. We place the different free water level position. It depend on uh, free water level. Maybe we can. Yes, yeah. the, the, the high function. The high function method is also. Uh, the, first of all, the very important thing is the the, the free water level. Where yeah. do you place the free water level? Uh, do you get it from the uh, uh, the uh, MTT? Or yeah. you are making an assumption, and then another thing is the the the, the porosity and the permeability. Do you have? Uh, you can you can compute your porosity from your logs, but uh, permeability is just an uh, estimation. You cannot compute a You can you cannot get a compute good computation of permeability from logs because permeability is a dynamic measurement. It is not a static measurement, whereas the uh, porosity is a static measurement, so you can comfortably compute the porosity from the logs, whereas the uh, permeability, it is a dynamic measurement, so it, it has to be measured. Whatever you compute from log is just an estimation, so how good your estimation is, then it will also affect your saturation high function results. And another thing is that when you have uh, uh, flow in your reservoir, you, you 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 should be actually using the relative permeability rather than the absolute permeability, yeah. right? So what we are getting from our core data is normally uh, the measured uh, permeability is actually an uh, uh, is, is, is intrinsic permeability of the rock. You know, we we are only flowing one fluid. You do not normally you do experiment with relative permeability, but normally uh, the, the continuous permeability that you measure for every one foot interval or so is an absolute permeability because you are only either injecting uh, a brine or you are injecting air, right? Mm -hmm. So that will also be uh, have an impact on your saturation high function. Yes, so right. as as we say, nothing is actually absolute in whatever we compute. There will always be uncertainties. Yeah. So of yeah. course. Yeah. The, the, the more data you have, the better your estimation is going to be. Yeah, because in low resistivity reservoir, if we didn't have uh, MDT data or RFT data, it it was very difficult to define the oil water contact and also free water level. Of course, if we want to define the saturation head function. So what we normally do is that we make an estimate. How we make an estimate is that you come up with your height function, and then you move your uh, free water level in the equation. So no. You change your you change your your free water level in the equation. So which means you vary your you iterate your 
your or high above the free water level. And when you have a match between the two saturation, and you say that that's where my free water level is. Even then, you're trying to force your high function to match your resistivity derived saturation. So which may or may not be very accurate in the first place. Okay. Okay. On the next question. This method RVRH is useful, useful for laminated sand cell or structural cell and dispersed cell as well. Are there any different formula for these three types of cell descent? Okay, the type of shell. Is it useful for uh, all of the cell type to be the equation? No, I think I think the, the the very reason that it is being uh, labeled laminated shale sand equation. So I think it, it should be used for uh, laminations only. Okay. If it, as I mentioned earlier already, if if you have dispersed clays inside, you can't help it because you can never you can never uh, derive a good uh, resistivity anymore because it's all all dispersed. So the first thing is that when you are when you when you're going to evaluate your your uh, thin bed analysis, do a thin bed analysis. The very first thing you have to find out is whether I have laminates or not. Okay. That's why the Thomas Tuber plot is very important because to see and where the data points are falling, then you can see whether it is uh, your shales are dispersed or your clays are your mm -hmm. shales are laminated. If it is laminated, then you go ahead and do your modeling and uh, come up with a second. If it is dispersed, I don't think you can do much. Okay. So, you can do correct. You can do correction for uh, shear by using. You no, know, we have people have done it. People have done uh, uh, hydro, uh, the uh, shear correction on the density, shear correction on the neutron, and come up with the porosity. And then uh, the resistivity you, you, you by using a, a shearly sand equation like Indonesian saturation equation or uh, Nigeria equation or Simondu or Waxman Smith, you compensate for the, uh, the shear resistivity and then come up with. Uh, with your, your evaluation. So that will be application applicable for a dispersed clay model. But in lamination model, laminated model, you need to do the resistivity modeling. Okay. So the best one for the FKRH method is if we have the laminated sand, uh, shell, yeah? Yes, yes, for, it's for lamination, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question. What is the porosity that you use in Thomas Taber plot? Sometimes using explode porosity is overestimating in the for shell, shell porosity. Yeah, yeah that, is a, yeah. that is a very, very tough question to answer because <laughs> it's effective or total porosity. It, 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 depend, it depends on the company. Yeah. It depends on the company that you are work, working for. Some companies like to use uh, uh, total porosity. Some companies like to use effective porosity. Some companies like to use cross plot porosity from the density neutron cross plot. Some companies like to use uh, average, which is uh, some uh, some and divided by two. And so it depends. So mm -hmm. it depends on your, your your company policy and you follow what your company policy is. Because uh, at the end of the day, your whatever method you use, your, your hydrocarbon in place should be more or less the same. But uh, what is going to affect is your uh, porosity. If you're going to use effective or, or total porosity, you must keep the, the same system. You cannot mix the, you know, I have a better porosity, so I use uh, total porosity because total porosity is always bigger than effective porosity. And I have a, a lower saturation in, uh, in effective saturation, so I'm going to use, you can't do that. You have to use the same system. If you use the total porosity, you have to use uh, SW total. Then you come up with your hydrocarbon uh, volume. Then if you are using effective porosity, you have to use effective saturation, and then you come up with your, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, the hydrocarbon in place should be the same. So uh, for as, as for plotting the Thomas Sieber plot, uh, whether you're going to use a cross plot porosity or you're going to use a porosity from the density alone, or you're going to use a, a mixture. There are some companies which even use a porosity directly from neutron. So mm. I think it's a company policy. So maybe the experience shows that uh, they have relatively clean sand and uh, the, the porosity of the neutron works very well in sand. That's okay. But uh, if you start with a lot of shales inside, inside your, your sand, your porosity from uh, neutron would be overestimating it. Yeah. Because if we have uh, the clean sand, the total porosity will be the same with the effective porosity. But if we deal with yeah. the bed and shell sand, the effective porosity will be very different than the total porosity, right? Yes. And even if you look at neutron porosity, and now, now we are going into a different subject, but uh, if you're looking at neutron porosity, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a porosity computed based on the count rates, right? Okay. So uh, the, uh, it depends on what, what sort of transform the company is using. 
No, are they using a transform for sandstone or are they using a transform for, for, for limestone or is it a transform from dolomite? And you're going to come up with a different uh, uh, neutron porosities. So you have to be careful of what porosity are, are going to use. That's why we make it a standard that whatever porosity that we, we cross plot on the density neutron plot, it should always be on limestone. Yeah. Okay. We move to another question, also from the another question. Uh, could be small crossover between the DTM neutron eventually in the zone? Yeah. Uh, the, the the cross the crossover between neutron density is a, is a, is, a, is a funny thing because uh, it depends very much on how you plot it, right? Uh, some people use 1.65, 1.65 at the left and 2.65 at the right, and then and then the neutron uh, accordingly to either mi uh, minus 15 to plus 45, or some people plus one 1.7, 1.6. Depends on the company how you plot it. So uh, the, you can move your density and neutron to plot whichever you want and create a, a, a crossover. You can plot it in such a way that uh, the liquid field, water field, or sandstone can look like an, a gas reservoir. Or you can plot your log in such a way that the gas reservoir, the gas crossover disappears and looks like a water zone. So it, you have to be very careful when you look at uh, the plot itself on density and neutron. So the crossover can be there or can disappear depending on how you choose your density scale, right? But if you're on a cross plot, as long as you are plotting the neutron porosity in the limestone unit and the density log as it is, you will never make a mistake because the, the, the lithology lines are already fixed. Depending, even though you have different companies, they are more or less the same, same, same type of plot. So that you have got a sandstone, you've got a, in the middle is the limestone and the bottom is the dolomite. So you will always have, uh, if you have a gas reservoir, you will always see that it is above the lithology line. So even though that crossover, crossover may disappear on the neutron and density or log plot because the way that you have plotted it, right? And also the way that you use the scale also depends on your company. Hmm. For example, I was working for Petronas. We use 1.85, 2.85 for density. Hmm. Some people use 1.65, 2.7. Some people use 1.6, 2.6. So it depends on the company policy and the people have to be aware of how it is plotted. No, you just don't, don't just look at the density of neutron cross plot and say that it's my gas, it's my oil, it's my water, right? So you have to be careful. The best thing is always plot it on a cross plot. Okay, that's right. So then, how to see hydrocarbon in silicon lamination? Yeah. Pardon? I think this is not for the hydrocarbon yeah. lamination. <clears throat> Yeah, because the, the problem with lamination is that as you, as you saw it, the, uh, the even the density log, because of the resolution that is only about what, nine feet, uh, nine inches or about a, about a foot resolution, and neutron is even worse. It's got a, it, it has got a, a, a bigger, uh, uh, it cannot detect, it's very low uh, resolution tool. So they are taking averages across it. So when you plot it even on density and neutron, sometimes they may be so shaly that uh, you don't see the hydrocarbon anymore. So some people have, there have been methods whereby you go and uh, compute the shear volume and then correct for the density and neutron so that you can move it back to the lithology line. It, it works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. So it is also very uh, uh, subjective. You know. Okay. For well, the next question, what is the most appropriate method for rock typing on pin bed behavior? <clears throat> Are there any special method on the rock type? Again, again, the here again also it will depend on uh, rock typing. Normally, uh, if you have core data, of course you you are going to use your core data and come up with your <clears throat> come up with your rock, rock typing based on 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 polar pump plot, right? The porosity pump plot, and then you are going to group into different uh, different rock types and come up with rock type one, two, three, four, so forth. And if you don't have any core data, you are going to depend purely on log derived porosity and log derived permeability. So there again, how good your uh, porosity estimation, how good your permeability is going to affect your rock typing. So uh, I don't think you're going to get a, a definitive answer to your question saying that what is the best method. Because sometimes all of the plots may be uh, plotting in a, in a very, very big group and you might not be able to even able to identify the rock types anymore. Okay. So, uh, for, for, I don't think for thinly better than more, I don't think it's the normal way of rock typing is going to work very well there, you know. Hmm. Okay, 
maybe this is the uh, last question. Yeah, I see. There's no question again. On I think they already. I think they already fed up with my answers. I think. Question again. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Formation anisotropy is not matter of thin laminated sand shale, but also slum deposit, bioturbation, and debris flow, which have similar character of gamma ray. Let's say blocking gamma ray shape. How do yeah, we learn yeah. from another RVRH due to this? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. It is true. Yes, it is true because uh, you, because of the uh, let's say uh, diogenesis or bioturbation or whatever, you're going to have low resistivity in your in your sands, right? So. Your RVRH can be different because of that, not necessarily because of lamination, but the whole uh, underlying assumption in this uh, lamination, uh, laminated sand evaluation is that you are going to assume that your sands are laminated, right? Then only this method works. If your sands are not laminated and if it's just a mixture of, 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 of clays and sand or bioturbation, you're going to have a, a RV and RH difference. So, but that doesn't mean that uh, you, they're laminated and that, that this, this model is not going to work. Okay. So, so it, alternative yes. method, which we have tried uh, for for uh, uh, this bioturbated uh, sense, is also to come up with a uh, height function. But even that is also questionable. But still better than the standard evaluation, right? It's not probably the the absolutely correct method, but still better than the the standard method of uh, lumping everything together and come up with a saturation. So we have tried for, uh, there are several areas where we have uh, a lot of bioturbation or where we have uh, the, the, the rock itself is, uh, uh, because of the, the mixture in the rock itself is giving us this low resistivity by having some sort of, uh, uh, of conductive minerals like pyrite or siderite or whatever. Then we have come up with a uh, high function and the, it does improve the uh, saturation, but does it mean that it is a real saturation? We do not know. Okay, the last question. There is one additional question. In a low resistivity with wavy lamination, so uh, not clear uh, RRL, yeah, but wavy lamination, uh, or even lenticular sand sedimentary structure, is it the using RVRH still relevant? Uh, if it is lamination, whichever way it is laminated, I think it's, it should be still valid, yes. Yeah, I agree with uh, Because, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I think this is all, all the question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kogi, for this uh, discussion tonight. Uh, hope you are always doing well. Uh, thank you for the SPA from the ESPG. Uh, Yi is uh, also still active, yeah. I see in in. in uh, yeah, I do. I do a bit of. Uh, uh, as, you know, uh, I always say that, you know, because uh, uh, knowledge sharing should be uh, widely shared, you know, because you whatever you, little knowledge you have, it's better to share it with everybody, yeah. and then then everybody uh, learns. I'm I'm also learning. When I, when I look at LinkedIn, I see some. Uh, things which are of, of value to me and I, I download it because the, you keep on learning right so but for, for the last two or three months i've stopped, stopped writing anything on linkedin because i've become too lazy i think maybe because of the COVID, you know you sleep you sleep more now <laughs> everyone feel it yeah <laughs> okay uh thank you very much once again Kogogi. and ask you uh i beg time to you uh. okay thanks but i did uh for the discussion and Pakoko, uh, thanks again on behalf of SPE Java section and ISPG. Uh, we are happy to have you here for the knowledge of the low resistivity. So actually, the case in Indonesia, many, many we found in the reservoir uh, all about the thin bed or low resistivity base. So hopefully, all the participants can get the benefit from the, uh, your knowledge. And Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me yeah, the opportunity. Yeah. And I hope that uh, I have been some helpful because as I mentioned, I'm not a geologist, so I cannot answer a lot of geological questions. And then furthermore, my experience on the thin bed analysis also is limited. So whatever I show has been done by some people and I try to understand it. In fact, I was even revising and uh, reading through my slides again last night so that I don't stumble. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Once thanks again. to all participants who can stay late until 
the end of this yeah it must, event. must be must be about 10 o'clock then right yeah 10 15 already but yeah, it's okay. okay i mean we are, we are still uh, enjoying this event yeah, so also, some of them also watching korean dr drama i guess <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, last but not least i think we can uh, open the video to have a picture picture time to all participants okay yeah maybe pak didit and bafanya can can help to make a snipping are you going to put 500 people in one screenshot <laughs> yeah yeah that's the idea Okay. That's our documentation. Please to all participants to uh, show, open your video. Some people are very shy, I guess. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. Please, what? Okay then. Okay, finish. Finish, finish. Yeah. So again, thanks. Uh, uh, have a a good day. So be safe in this uh, uh, COVID pandemic situation. To all participants, please uh, fill up the inflation form and all this material will be uploaded in the YouTube for the SP technical discussion group. Again, uh, good night, everybody. Good morning in Canada. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. Bye.